Brian, thanks for chatting with us. What can you tell me quarter to date regarding travel trends? Is there any sign at all of a slowdown in the US or Europe? And is the China revenge story, travel revenge story playing out? Yeah, I mean, we're seeing um, record results. You know, we did $1.9 billion this past quarter, um, but probably more importantly, over the last year, we generated $3.4 billion in free cash flow. And obviously, this is in the wake of major economic uncertainty, still a war going on in Europe. Um, but I think what the lesson here, Deidre, is even in a time of uncertainty, many people's office is now Zoom, the mall is now Amazon, the theater is now Netflix. So travel is becoming a key way that people are gathering together. And I think that's always going to exist, regardless of the economic environment. So we're still expecting really big demand this summer, just like last year. And have you seen those trends continue at the start of this year? Yeah, I mean, it's it's very, we've got great momentum. Um, I mean, yes, we, we, we shared our outlook uh, yesterday, and we are expecting a very strong and continued steady growth in Q1. That's right. So this quarter, let's talk about that outlook. You expect to grow revenue around 20%. For the whole year, though, you're expecting your EBITDA margin to be maintained, in other words, flat maybe from 2022. Um, while you're expecting also downward pressure on your average daily rate or ADR. Is this as profitable as Airbnb gets? I mean, I think Airbnb could continue to get more efficient. I mean, let's just let's just kind of set, uh, just to give you some context. Um, you know, three years ago, before we went public, the year before we went public, we lost $250 million on an adjusted EBITDA basis. And this past year, we did $2.9 billion on an adjusted EBITDA basis. And one of the reasons why is we have 5% fewer employees in 2019, and we did 75% more revenue. But what something else happened, as we got more lean, more disciplined, we took the very best people and cut from one problem. There are also fewer meetings, we can move faster. And so I think there's continually more efficiency, but I think the efficiency that's in front of us is gonna be things like customer service, reducing the amount of problems on Airbnb, reducing cancellations, things like that. And so as this machine gets more efficient, it will continue to get more profitable, but growth is really where we're gonna be focused. So the numbers you just mentioned, I know them well. I've been talking about them all day on TV and the profitability, real gap profitability, is certainly an achievement for investors that are more focused on that versus say growth as they might've been over the last few years. But I guess my question though, is that if that margin is going to only be maintained this year, how do you become more efficient from here on out? Well, I mean, again, I think there's a lot of opportunities. First of all, we are going to continue to grow and we're going to grow very rapidly over the coming years. And the reason we're, the way we're going to grow, first of all, is we're going to continue to perfect our core service, you know, how to find a home, the customer service, um, you know, providing better value. The next thing we want to do is make hosting mainstream. If people are watching this, they probably travel in Airbnb or known someone has. We want hosting to be just as popular. And then we want to make sure that we basically expand beyond the core by laying the foundation for new big ideas. So we have that going. But along the way, one of the things, Deirdre, we did is we did an exercise where we storyboarded the end-to-end -end experience for guest and host. And we looked at all the different friction points, all the different reasons people contacted Airbnb. How to like and how to improve the experience, and we, it's like kind of like a blueprint for the company. And we are incredibly focused on improving the experience and making the business even more efficient. I think there's massive efficiencies still in our business, but again, that's not our primary focus. We're still focused on growth, but I think there's this great thing where quality and growth have this great harmony. What does it mean for Airbnb to be mainstream? It's already a verb. Um, you've increased demand, you've increased supply. So how will you know when it's mainstream? Well, I think Airbnb is definitely mainstream on the brand. I mean, it's used as a noun and a verb all over the world. But most of the time people say, I'm getting Airbnb. Um, I'm going to, you know, I'm staying at Airbnb. I want people putting their home up to be nearly mm -hmm. as mainstream so that, you know, you probably have a lot of friends who stayed in Airbnbs. I want to get to a point where if we're truly successful, many of your friends are hosting. Mm -hmm. And that means it has to be easier. We have to keep providing more protections. And then especially in an economy like today, we need to remind people that this is a really great way to make supplemental income. You know, the average person who puts their home on Airbnb, half of them get a booking within three days, 75% mm -hmm. get a booking in nine days with the asset you already have. So that's a story that we need to keep telling. How big is that market? What do you think, um, you know, in terms of even market cap or TAM, Airbnb would be 
if hosting was mainstream? I mean, oh my, uh, we have 4 million hosts today and those 4 million hosts uh, created $63 billion in gross booking value. Um, it's anyone's guess how big Airbnb could be, but it could be so much larger. I mean, just to give you a quick story, the biggest question I've always gotten from investors from the very early days is how big is this market? Mm -hmm. No one ever really knew because it was a market that we essentially created or popularized. I mean, there were vacation rentals before us, but you know, there's a reason Airbnb is a noun and a verb. It was essentially kind of a new category. You know, people spend more on hotels every year than on than advertising. You know, that's a nearly trillion dollar market. You know, seven eight hundred billion or more. So there's an enormous amount of room for us to grow, and that doesn't even include long term rentals or or mm -hmm. really stays of of thirty days or longer which mm -hmm. is a fifth of our business or any future services. So we're just at the tip of the iceberg of like how big this could be. Okay, so to get bigger, you'd be essentially doubling down on the core of what you do, which is home sharing. But I wonder, you're profitable now, you're getting more supply online. Why not use this moment to diversify and create more revenue streams? Airbnb travel still you know, quite tied to the macro environment. So what if you had something to offset that in the way that Amazon has developed cloud or Apple has developed its services business? What could that be for Airbnb? Oh, it's a great question, Deidre. And the answer is we absolutely want additional revenue channels. I mean, Nike started as running shoes. That's a minority of its revenue today. Apple started as a Macintosh. That's a minority of its revenue. A Amazon started selling books. That's a minority of revenue. And I want one day for staying in a home on a short-term basis to be the minority of revenue in Airbnb. So I think there's a lot of opportunities this year we are also heads down working on some of those ideas. I can't share what those are yet, but expect some pretty Not big even a tease? <laughs> this is They're such gonna... a big tease. <laughs> I, I think there's, um, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll share one thing. You know, okay. I, um, a, a thing that I'm concerned about is just how isolated people are. Three years after the pandemic, as I said, I think that like one of the reasons people continue to turn to travel is because People want to connect one another, one another. And I think also, how do you meet people in the world today? So I think one of the things that Airbnb is great at is we've got this really great system of trust. We verify the identity of more than 100 million members on our platform. I think what we invented 15 years ago was probably more of a system of trust to get strangers to live together than probably anything else. And I think there's a lot of things we can do with that asset. There's things with travel, mm. there's things with more housing, but there's things even beyond that. So we're thinking pretty expansively about what we can do. But I also want to reassure people that I had a teacher when I was in college who said, Brian, you can do everything you want in your life, just not at the same time. And I learned a lesson. I think a lot of companies in Silicon Valley have learned a lesson that there always are new growth expansions, but you can't do too many things at once. You have to focus mm -hmm. on putting one foot in front of the other master what you're doing, and then build the building block for the next great innovation. And that's what we're trying to do. Well, that's exactly why I'm asking this, because it feels like you've gotten Airbnb to this profitable totally. point. Growth totally. is decelerating totally. a little bit, at least from the pandemic. So what's next? And well, now there's you guys a lot, are yeah. also- there, Yep, there's more coming. And I promise you that you'll be one of the first to know when okay. we're ready to unveil some of you it. Give me I a promise. little bit of a tease. Now I'm thinking like- <laughs> you have to, I, gotta, I gotta get I you know, to come, I, you, you, I gotta get you to have me back, so. Okay, we all as well. Okay, yeah. let's talk about the cash that you're sitting on as well. Not only are you profitable, you're sitting on more than $14 billion if you include uh, customer fund deposits. Thanks to rising interest rates, you're also earning a pretty penny on that cash. So what do you do with it? And what do you think, I know you're looking at other businesses, other revenue streams, but how do you think about category defining deals like what Google did with Android or Amazon with Whole Foods? Well, I mean, we're always open-minded to acquisitions. Um, we're going to have a very high, um, like, kind of, uh, like, uh, like, we're going to have a very high standard for any kind of integration that we'd want to do. We've done a couple large, notable acquisitions or medium-sized acquisitions, depending on how you want to size it, um, hotel tonight and luxury retreats. And we did both of those acquisitions because they brought a capability that we didn't have. We didn't know anything about hotel rooms. We didn't really know anything uh, a few years ago about the luxury market. So we're always going to be looking at what new capabilities could we bring in the company. <clears throat> but I'm generally not probably looking at acquisitions to speed up growth because we actually mm -hmm. have a lot of great innovation. So it's really about bringing in capabilities that we don't already have. We're looking. Um, and yeah, absolutely. There's We're always going to be opportunistic, but we're going to continue to be really disciplined. Understood. So does that mean that large scale acquisitions, say, over a billion dollars are on the table? 
I think that nothing's off the table. The bigger the acquisition, the higher the um, like the higher the conviction um, would have to be. So I, I wouldn't want to rule anything out. But we're going to be you know very very thoughtful about anything that we do. We had this conversation on Tech Check this morning, the show, um, and someone posited, why doesn't Airbnb have a loyalty program? Is there something you could do or acquire in that space? So I guess first question, why don't you have one yet? Secondly, is that something that you're looking at either organically or acquiring? I mean, like, uh, num the first thing is, like, I always thought, number one, the best loyalty program was people loving your products. They love your products so much, they're loyal to you unconditionally. You're not paying for that loyalty. At the same time, it is true that travel categories have some of the biggest loyalty programs. I think if we were to do something, I would want it to be really different than just like a points program. Um, so we're looking, we are looking at different ideas. Um, but I think, again, the best way to earn loyalty is for people loving your products. That's the North Star. And anything beyond that should be incremental. Do you think that people love your product as much as they did a few years ago? I mean, I know, you know, there's cracks about cleaning fees and upfront pricing and things like that. And I know that you've also been working really hard and been agile in giving them those things and more transparency. But how do you feel in terms of how the general public, your customers see the product? Well, statistically, they do love the product more. I mean, we do a lot of measurement of net promoter score. We look at like the incident rates for every reservation. We look at the percentage of stays that end in five-star reviews. We look at uh, retention and different cohort analysis. And statistically, the product is actually improving year over year. That mm -hmm. being said, you are correct that there are a lot of anecdotes on social media of people having some criticism about value or customer service or some other issue. And part of the reason why is because the bigger we get, even if it's a certain percentage of complaints, that scales linearly with the company. And so what we're doing is this 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 uh this spring in advance of summer we have another release coming we do these twice a year we have the summer 2022 uh release i will certainly want to talk to you about that there are some new ideas but mainly mm -hmm. what you're going to see is an end-to-end -end look at the guest and host experience and many improvements along the way nearly every complaint that someone's made we should I can't say we can fully answer, but we are working on nearly everything. And so I think you'll see some big improvements this year. Okay, a few last really quick questions. Um, you mentioned cost discipline. Um, this is something that other CEOs are trying to play catch up on, many in the tech space. What did you see that maybe they didn't over the last few years? <clears throat> what I saw was, you know, I mean, here's, here's what I saw. We were operating Airbnb similar to most other companies. Then we had what feel, felt like a near-death experience. And I've luckily never had a real near-death experience, but I had what felt like that from a business perspective. And what it's described is it's like your life flashes before your eyes, our business flashed before our eyes. <clears throat> and it was like running into a burning building. And I thought to myself, if we can only keep half our business, which half could we keep? <clears throat> and that was very clarifying. <clears throat> and we realized that a lot of the activities we were doing, we didn't need to do. And so we took hundreds of projects and we scoped them back and we took many of the very best people and we focused them on a few problems, getting really disciplined and focused on the core. And something remarkable happened. Not only did we save money, but we started moving faster. People had more motivation. They were in fewer meetings. They had more ownership of their work. It started feeling like a startup again. And actually what happens, we started growing faster. And so then we became very careful about adding new people because we didn't want to build like the Navy. We wanted to build like this small, lean, elite, like kind of special force team. And that's yeah. kind of the model that we've had ever since to be small, lean, and elite, and not just mm -hmm. to save money, but to move faster and give more people a sense of ownership in their work. And so you said, we're never going to forget that lesson. So that's what right. we did. And you showed a lot of discipline when maybe some others didn't. I guess you're essentially saying you became a wartime CEO. That was a phrase. And you get popular. once you do, Years it's ago. hard to ever forget that. It's hard to ever forget that. I will it's never fair. forget the lessons of 2020. Um, last question. You mentioned the potential of generative AI in your business on the call last night. Um, just very broadly, how transformative do you see this technology that it could be? Would you compare it to the cloud, the mobile, or the internet revolution? All three, none of them? Probably bigger than all of them. Okay. Maybe all of them combined. Hard to say, but if you were to tell me, it'll be bigger. The than industrial all revolution. Hard to know. If, hard to know. That's like a really high bar. Um, you know, a true revolution is a high bar. But this is. It feels to me like the biggest technological 
thing that's happened in my lifetime or certainly will rival anything I've seen in my lifetime. And so I think I think a lot of things are going to change. Okay, well, we look forward to see what you do with that. Uh, Brian, Thank thanks so much for being with us again. Talk to you soon. All right, bye.